Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today, my guest is Ted Harrington. Ted is an ethical hacker, an executive partner at Independent Security Evaluators, a professional speaker, and the author of the just released book, Hackable. Ted, welcome to the show. What's up, man? I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, and so for the, for the listeners and viewers out there, Ted and I have known each other for years. We got uh, introduced um, a while back talking at, at a conference. I sat in on his talk because I was interested in some of the ethical hacking stuff, and we've been friends ever since. So it's it's just awesome to have you on the show, Ted, um, right after your book has been coming out. You've been prepping for this for a long time. So before we get into some of that and, and what you're working on now, why don't you take a moment and give our audience just a little bit more of your background and, and and how data plays a role in what you do. How do you work with data and, and what you've done in your career? Sure, yeah. So I, I run a company of, like as you mentioned, ethical hackers. And basically what that means is that we're, we're the good guy hackers. And companies hire us to help them find their security vulnerabilities before the bad guy does so that we can help them fix it. And uh, so that's essentially what we do. And whether we're paid to do that because the company's hiring us or we do it as research, it sort of all has the same mission, which is to make things better, help help innovators build technology. And your question about data, it's it's really it's an interesting question because in so many ways, data is like the center of the whole field of security, which is that's our our job is to protect data. And you know, we can talk about different types of attack scenarios and threat modeling and stuff later today. But the I think the the thing that's really interesting is that data itself, it's sometimes not even the data that's the thing that the attacker's going after. It's what the access or lack of access to the data or the integrity or lack of integrity to the of the data. Those are the things that attackers might sometimes be going after. And that's mm. where I think the field of ethical hacking gets really, really exciting because it's not as binary and simple as did someone steal data? It's what did they do to the business in the way that they interacted with the data? Right. You know, I have a, just a random question because of what you just mentioned is how do organizations even know that data may have been compromised a lot of the time? I, I feel like there's there's a gap there that a lot of businesses that I've worked with may not even have the ability to understand if they've been hacked. Is that an actual problem or am I just not aware of the tools that they may have to, to identify when they may have been victims of, of an attack? It's a very significant problem. And there's two parts actually to the question. So the way that most attackers actually operate is that they'll, in furtherance of whatever they're trying to achieve, they'll, they'll try to get a, a foothold in the company that they're attacking and they don't necessarily always make it known what they're doing and some attacks don't even actually execute anything malicious for quite some time the point is just to have that sort of privileged position mm -hmm. so the first question is our first part of your question basically is um how does does, is there a period of time between when someone is compromised and when they know about it? And the answer to that is yes. And it's usually a really, really long time. It's like uh, 400 days or something wow. is what a lot of the data shows. The second part to the question is th whether or not there are ways to flag it or to even know this. Like how does someone know? Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of tools out there that help sort of um, flag when these types of issues are happening. But the sort of most blunt way is that the victim can't avoid <laughs> the fact that they're a victim. So maybe whatever it was that was stolen from them. So for example, let's say some uh, many of our customers work in the movie business and mm -hmm. uh, what they're trying to protect and what the attackers want is the next big blockbuster before it comes oh, to the sure. theaters. And those, you know, you're talking about the the big, the tent poles, those are like a billion dollar asset that's a digital file. Yeah. They know because that film appears on some sort of internet site. So right. there's sort of sometimes that sort of forcing function that it's not like a tool was like, hey, you got hacked. It's like yeah. the news says, hey, you're in this headline. And 
that's how a lot of companies find out. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's easy when you're not in that business to not realize just how con, you know concentrated the value is. And a billion dollar investment comes out in a two hour sort you know, file of some sort that could be completely extracted and put somewhere else. And, and you don't necessarily lose your ability to monetize that, but you certainly have a, a me, immediate and significant impact to your bottom line as a result of that uh, happening. So really. I, I want to talk. There's so many topics that I want to talk to you about. It's, it's just it's great to have you on the show. But um, one of the things before we get into the details of what Hackable is all about and where the inspiration for that came from and why you decided to do it, I want to understand. So the first thing that I thought about is, is why such a low tech channel to teach your highly technical wisdom? Like, why, why write a book? It feels like shouldn't there be a, a fancier hacker way to do this kind of communication to people? Or was there is there a method to the madness? Because knowing you, there's always a method to the madness. What uh, <laughs> what precipitated that? I, I, I like that question a lot. Well, the first part of the answer is you got to meet people where they are. Right. And if the smart people in the world read books, you gotta write a book for them, right? And there are plenty of other places to um, take the content that has been created in the book and replicate it and use it. So whether that's on a talk or in virtual talks or in webinars or on podcasts like we're doing here, yeah. there's all kinds of ways to use it, but really the sort of source material becomes the book. And even though our society has evolved so dramatically from the days when books were first invented, Books are still the central source of information, even though the same information is going to wind up being in digital form, sure. right? Uh, that's the funny thing about writing a book. You you write it entirely in a digital format to give it to someone to make it physical, mm -hmm. <laughs> to then upload it somewhere. Digital. It's like <laughs> it's the world we live in. But yeah, that's what that's why I did. I felt that uh, the the way the best what I was really trying to do is I was trying to help more people, mm -hmm. and books are an effective way to be able to do that. Right. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny because I got my copy of it last week. I wanted it to be completely read by the time we talked today. I didn't quite achieve that goal, but it's, I'm close. I'm, I'm more than halfway, but the, um, the question that I want to ask you is, so, you know, this is a relatively niche area, or at least it feels like a relatively niche area, application security and, and, you know, ethical hacking and all this, like, do I have to be super deep technically to read this book or who, who did you write this book for? I guess would be the question. No, you do not need to be, uh, very technical to read the book, not because it's not for technical people, but because I wrote it to make it easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And, I'm going to answer your question in two different ways. Who did, I, who did I write the book for? So the first question is, who's the audience of the book? And the second question is, who was in my who was I uh, writing the words to? Mm -hmm. So the first question, who who's the audience of the book? This is written for really anybody that is responsible for the security of a software system. Mm -hmm. So in some companies, that's the CTO or the CIO. In other companies, it's the VP of engineering. In some companies, it's a security professional. You know, it, it varies across the board, but it's whoever is at the other end of the pointed finger when someone says, you are in charge of security. Right. <laughs> and in most companies, actually, that person's security is not their whole job. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the reason that I wanted to write the entire process end to end from like how to think to how to go do it to then mm -hmm. how to convert it into business value. That's sort of the structure of the book. So that's the first question. Who's it for? It's for technology leaders. Mm -hmm. The second part of the question is, who was I speaking to? And, and I use that word speaking intentionally because what I really wanted to do with this book was I wanted, to, I wanted it to feel conversational. I wanted someone who's reading it to feel like, oh, this is what it would be like talking to Ted about these ideas. And yeah. that's actually extraordinarily difficult to do to actually write the way that you speak. And yes. that was one of the biggest parts of the editing process. And so the person that in my mind that I was sitting across the table from explaining these ideas to was my 13 year old nephew. Mm. He's a really smart, really interested kid. Um, and of course I could visualize actually talking to him. Uh, and I've also had conversations with him about this topic area. So it wasn't for me, it wasn't a huge stretch, but mm -hmm. that exercise, what it did was 
it really helped simplify things, right? So for mm-hmm. example, you know, we all work in corporate America and how often have you said a whole string of words that is just jargon? You know, like I was, I, I was on a <laughs> talk the other day where someone's like, Ted, can you tell us about how the emergence of artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to change digi- digital transformation in the age of big data? And what does this have to do with quantum computing? And I'm like, <laughs> guys, none of that is English. Let's... <laughs> And so, you know, to my nephew, I might say, how do we deal with change? Right. It's much simpler. It's much easier to understand. It's the way you would talk to a human being. And that's the way I wrote the whole book. And I think the best compliment that I've gotten so far from people who've read it is people saying, Ted, I felt like I was just sitting in the room with you and you were having a conversation with me. Yeah. And I was like, I, that's how I know that I nailed it. Well, and, and you did. I mean, I, I've literally had conversations with you about some of the things you've covered in the book. And and that's where I, I mean, I could hear your voice and it comes through. And that's it, it's it is really an achievement because I think, you know, what you 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 live in a place where just getting out of the gate is an incredibly technical, difficult thing. Understanding what to do is a very difficult thing to do, but you're able to make it relatable through the use of stories. And I think that that's, and and I know that that's an area that you've studied is how do you tell a story and how do you make an analogy? You've done it 10 times in this interview already is how do I make something that is approachable for anybody so that they can anchor to something that they're very familiar with and draw a parallel with some variable substitutions into something that they need to understand better. And and I think that's an incredibly effective tool. And that's what makes your book very accessible for people that have never even thought about the role of of ethical hacking or application security or all these things that we'd prefer to not think about in the, the, you know, technology and data leadership circles. Totally, man. Yeah. I mean, Stories are engaging. We're as human beings, we're we're hardwired to consume stories. And to go back to your question before about like why write a book? Is there not a more technically, uh, you know, evolved way to do this? We're let's just think about who humans are, right? Going all the way back to when we were in caves. Mm-hmm. Stories is how information is transferred. It's literally hardwired into our DNA uh, from a biological perspective because it's a it's a survival mechanism that's how knowledge is transferred from one generation to the next over time Mm -hmm. and you need to tell stories in order to be able to help people take action and one of the things that was really both difficult and really exciting about writing this particular book was how these stories are if you if you went and asked a the person sitting at the keyboard in the middle of a security assessment, what they would say would be probably pretty technical. Mm-hmm. And it's really difficult to then, how do you, how do you simplify that out? And why, do, why does that matter? What does it mean? But then once you can do that, that's what the exciting part is because then once you can do that, hacking stories are awesome. They're <laughs> so interesting and they're so unexpected. I mean, the best stories have plot twists and have villains mm-hmm. and have heroes. It's like, Every hacking story has all the great elements of of a story. So that and, and and maybe just as a as a little bit of a preview of of what they may find in the book, can you tell us one of those hacking stories? Can you tell us one of the the classic ones? One of your favorite stories from you know doing this work that you do that is kind of like I mean, there's a superhero aspect to this. People don't understand the mechanics of what you do most of the time to actually hack things. So it seems like magic, right? And so that's where a lot of folks. Um, you know, just don't even know where to start. So I'm curious, like, can you give us a story and then maybe follow that up with if you wanted to start to do a little bit of hacking or even what hacking is, where would you even begin this? OK. Oh, there's so many good stories that, that I love, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll tell you one that has to do with online games. Mm-hmm. So online gaming for people who might not be familiar with it it's just what it sounds like it's a video game that you play online and in these games they have currencies and so the idea is you can accumulate or earn or even buy currency in the game that you can use in the gameplay so you can Hmm. um, buy a special weapons upgrade or access to a secret level or, or whatever and the way that 
these systems work is they have effectively a banking system in the game to facilitate the transaction. So I'm way oversimplifying, but the idea would be you have, you know, your 500 coins, let's call them, or diamonds, different games call them different things, but you've got your 500 coins and you need a weapon that costs 100 coins. So mm -hmm. it's 500 minus 100 equals your new balance is you're left with what? 400 coins. Right. Well, there is a, a hacker who goes by the pseudonym of Manfred, who was for many years, I mean, literally decades, what he did was look at these gaming systems and the flaws that existed in them. And he would, in particular, look at this banking function. And he asked this what if question. And I'm giving you the sneak peek. What if? Asking what if questions. That's oh, the yeah. answer to your second question, which is where should you start? And I'll, uh -huh. I'll expand upon that. But he asked this what if question, which was, well, the way this banking system works is it's saying 500 minus the withdrawal amount equals the new balance. So it's assuming the withdrawal amount will be a positive number, 500 mm -hmm. minus 100. What if I used a negative integer? So he would actually make the system react to 500 minus negative 100. Hmm. And as we all learned in middle school, subtracting a negative is actually addition. Right. So he would get the whatever weapons upgrade that he was buying. But the more important thing was he would now grow this account balance. So 500 coins minus negative 100 is now 600 coins. Hmm. And he was able to do this essentially ad infinitum. He could do it without any sort of limiter other than the practical limitations of how many he could accumulate, which it wound up being literally almost $400 trillion <laughs> US dollars worth of Whoa. currency accumulated, which is like ridiculous. It, yeah, He's obviously not going to go make $400 trillion. But the point was the game is not supposed to work that way. Mm -hmm. The developers did not intend it to work that way. It was not supposed to do that, but it did. Mm -hmm. And stories like that, which that's a true and real story, stories like that are very revealing in that they, they're they the kind of thing that really happens all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Companies build systems that are built by humans, which no, I'm not in any way diminishing software developers or, or anybody who works on a software system, but we're all humans right. and humans make mistakes. So these vulnerabilities exist. And if we don't ask these what if questions, and that's where ethical hackers really come in. If you don't have people um, coming into a system and looking at why it works the way that it does and can it work in a different way, right. then those types of vulnerabilities are going to exist forever and ever and ever and that was really kind of one of the big big takeaways of that is you know there's there was no way to there's no tool that can help mm -hmm. you find that you can't automate something like that you need someone to actually look at the system and and find those vulnerabilities that's it, i love that story and it, it's like you know test driven development sounds great and until you realize that unless you test for it, it's not going to be protected. And and we talk about and, and even in my book, I talk about, you know, just because you mean well doesn't mean you're guaranteed to add value. It doesn't mean you're actually guaranteed a positive outcome from what your effort is. They are separate. They may be correlated most of the time, but there is no guarantee that any individual effort is going to result in a positive outcome for whatever it is that you're trying to do. And, and I think that, you know, this notion of what if, which is literally one of the things you talk about early in the book, right? It's like, that's the, the core to all of this. I think that's a a good lesson for all of us, because even if I don't want to be a, a, a hacker of, of any stripe, I can benefit from thinking that way more in whatever my function is in, inside my organizations. Oh, even it, let's zoom out, right? <laughs> even if we're not talking about data or software or technology, we're just talking about life. Oh, yeah. That that mindset of looking at something from the other viewpoint, from how, how can you attack it? How can you break it? What's the what's the worst thing that could happen? If that was going to happen, how would it happen? That Those are the kinds of things that I even advise just my friends who are business leaders, you know, my friends who are CEOs of companies or whatever. I'm like, here's how you think about competition. Here's how you should think about regulation. Here's how you should think about disruption mm -hmm. is – Put yourself in the regulator's shoes and look at your company now and attack your company from that viewpoint. Mm. And that helps you start to figure out, okay, where do I have weaknesses? Where is it maybe built on uh, quicksand rather than on cement? Right. That that makes a lot of sense. So, I, it, And this is where I think 
you know, even more broadly speaking than what you intended your book to be. I think that what you talk about here and, and like you just mentioned, this is a parable for or for life in general. Like, how do we look at things a little bit differently? This is a this is a leadership book as much as it is about application security. And, and as far as I as, as far as I interpret it, it's teaching me more about things that are not related directly to application security than I thought was going to be the case. Right. So it's, I think, uh, something that I would, I would highly recommend to, um, anybody out there that is, is in any way finding this interesting. I think it's a, it's a book that's much more accessible than, than what you would typically expect. So there's a couple other areas. And, and if we have some time, I would like to talk to you about that, that process of creating the book, but there's a couple other areas that I want to touch on before we spend some time on, on what it's like to become an author. And I'm always curious in, in other people's, um, perspective on that. But first, we're still in the throes and and currently this is, you know, uh, early December and um you know, the pandemic is still very much here. We're we're having a lot of um, you know, case growth still. We're having a lot of um, you know, deaths due to the pandemic. Has I assume it has somehow. How has the pandemic impacted application security? How has it how has it changed or what hasn't changed in the pandemic times in 2020 uh, versus what it was like in, in 2019 and, and prior? Well, the biggest change is the move to remote, remote workforce and the, uh, the domino effect that has created in terms of reliance on tools. And in that shift where everyone is saying, okay, we have to work remotely and so we have to use tools and we have to provide access to things in different ways, th those of course fundamentally change the threat model. They change how a system might be attacked or why it would be attacked or by whom. And the thing that I found to be really interesting, I haven't really heard anyone talking about this particular aspect but I find it super, super fascinating is when I think about Zoom. So Zoom, of course, the video platform, Zoom has had the both sides of a coin. <laughs> on one side, they've had the black eye. On the other side, they've had the something we should all aspire to. And so the black, the black eye side is that so Zoom is Zoom's an application, right? They're they're the they're exactly what this book is talking about. How right. does someone who builds a software system, how do they deal with potentially uh, getting hacked. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about Zoom is there were a few things on the sort of black eye side of, of the coin. The first was they made all these claims that they used end-to-end -end encryption and they clearly did not. And so that, of course, beget the question, are you lying or do you just not understand what end-to-end -end encryption is, which <laughs> begets other questions, which is like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so that wasn't a good look for them. <laughs> no. But, and then another thing that wasn't awesome for them was that uh, there was a what's called a zero day vulnerability, which is basically the defender has zero days to fix the issue before it's exploitable. It's a, that's where it's a really big deal. Uh -huh. There was a zero day in Zoom for sale on the black market for like 500 grand or something. So the mm -hmm. combination of these two things, these really weren't great for mm -hmm. Zoom. Um, you've got this sort of emerging platform that had somehow, I still don't know how they did it. They, they leapfrogged all the, I mean, go to meeting, Google meet Skype, all these things were in the market ahead of zoom and zoom mm -hmm. all of a sudden is like, it's like a, a noun or a, a verb right now. I'm zooming. Right. Yeah. And so that wasn't great for zoom. The other side of the coin though was pretty cool. It was to see zoom's reaction. So Zoom went out and they hired themselves a chief information security officer. They made that person report to the CEO. They hired a, they significantly expanded their security team. They went and they hired not just one, but multiple of, uh, of security consulting firms, which is somewhat unusual that they mm -hmm. would hire multiple. And they hired legitimate security consulting firms. Um, they didn't hire me, which is maybe <laughs> another thing that should be on the black guy. Yes. <laughs> but, but the ones they hired are like, okay, those guys are legit. Um, and I, I, and they've been really transparent in talking about what they've been going through and what they're trying to do and why they're doing it. And from afar, I've, re I've really admired that approach because here's the, the truth is that security is never done. No one is ever, I mean, the reason I titled the book hackable is because the idea of unhackable doesn't exist. Right. And so I wanted to start from that baseline that like, look, nothing's, 
nothing is completely free from from attack. We all should accept that. And but what we need to do is we need to, and by we I'm talking about like not just the security community, but the community of innovators and entrepreneurs and people building these software systems. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that first you have to actually secure your system. And then you need to prove it. And the way you prove it is through authentic communication, talking about what you're doing, why you're doing it, uh, how you're finding your issues. And and that's something that Zoom, you know, they, they're they still screwing things up. They're still stepping on their own feet, but they're, they're going in the right direction. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that I think any of us watching that story from afar can say like, that's great. And this is a really long answer to your question about what's changed. That I think is one thing that's changed is that because Zoom has become something that's so central to everybody's lives, <laughs> And we see both the best and the worst of what's happening with Zoom. There's a lot of lessons that we can take out of that. And my hope is that moving forward, the best side is sort of what is uh, what's featured. Yeah, no, and 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 it's certainly something that everybody's been working with now. Is like I can't think of a day where I haven't used at least two or three different platforms, and I have my own opinions on which I like best and which ones are are most usable. But I don't really have an opinion on which do I think is the most secure. Which do I think has done the best job in protecting our corporate assets and information and, and things like that. I just trust. Okay, whatever I can use, I can use, and and not have to think twice about it. And I think that's you know not to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like, you know, application security and, and the security of, of what we're doing is everybody's responsibility, at least to a point, because it sounds from from what I've understood from your book, it's like the biggest vulnerability is probably me in any given circumstance. Probably, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the the difficulty is that the the problems, the vulnerabilities, the threat, like it comes from everywhere. And what we need to do is we really need to, first of all, accept that. And then we need to assess our situations accordingly. And that's where I think a lot of companies stumble because they don't have a great way to organize their thoughts about like, how much should I spend? What should I spend it on? What should I do first? What should I do second? And that's one of the things I really tried to sort of uh, put in triage and put into sort of a hierarchy in this book is help clarify that a little bit. Cause I see companies all the time do things like, all right, well, I walked through the airport and I saw ads for these three types of products. So I'm going to go buy those types of products. And those products, I read the airport ads. They promise I'm hundred percent secure now. <laughs> and unfortunately it just doesn't really quite work that way. And not everyone shares the same threat profile and not to say you don't need tools. You, you need mm -hmm. tools. But the sort of false promises that people get that any given tool solves all your, it's like, it's just not, it's not the way that it works. Yeah. And and it doesn't really matter what your, your functional specialty is. If you're running out there thinking a tool is going to solve all your problems, it's probably not going to. And and that we see time and again. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it is a difficult challenge for any organization that has a limited number of resources, which is all organizations. You know, how do I figure out what to put towards securing my environment, securing my applications versus the work towards developing them and, and the core functionality versus the people versus the, you know, other assets we may have versus like, how do you, how do you even do that? Like what, what how, you, you talked a little bit about like where you might prioritize that, but how do you put the application security box and, and, and security box in general alongside everything else and figure out what's right for your, for your organization? Oh, that, yeah, that's the million dollar question for sure, right? <laughs> Where should you invest time, effort, money, and resources? And there are a few elements to that problem. Uh, so first element, I this part I don't talk about too directly in my book, but this is this is good advice and it's directly related to your, uh, to your question, is that in any given company, you need someone who's in charge of security mm -hmm. and that someone needs to report to the CEO. Mm -hmm. And... I can't say it any simpler than that. I know that 95% of the people listening to this are going to be like, yeah, 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 no, we have that. We have someone in charge of security and he reports to the CEO through like four layers. Right. <laughs> it's like eventually it gets to the CEO, right? Yeah. But the reason that doesn't work is, and, and I'm being cavalier, not all companies have the four layers, but what actually happens a lot is that most companies say, well, security reports to the CTO or reports to the CIO. The problem is then when the, 
CEO brings the, the C-suite together and says, all right, let's talk about technology. CTO, what do we got? Yeah, They're going to filter the security concerns through the development priority concerns. Yeah, And that's not good conflict. So within a person, that kind of conflict automatically means that security will be deprioritized. That's but right. when you have the security leader report to the CEO, now, when the leaders, when the CEO says, all right, let's talk technology, the CTO and the CISO, they say, all right, well, he wants this timeline, but she wants this other thing. And now you have a healthy debate mm -hmm. about what's the best balance for the company in terms of meeting its business objectives and timelines and revenue projections versus uh, the additional things that might need to happen to secure what you're trying to do. Yeah, it's 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 a risk management function. It's it's a you know there's a need for a balance in the uh, debate and in the information flow so that the decision maker can make a decision without having only part of the equation to work with. And and I think that's a that's an interesting point. I think there's a lot of debate because if you if you want to say okay, well the CISO should be reporting to the CEO, which I think you make a strong argument. What do you say to the you know other C level executives that exist out there that um, have led to now your C suite is eighty three people? Um, you know, is is the CISO the exception? Like, yes, we need them as part of the C suite, and then it's them and eight other people, and that's our our, our C suite. Or do you think there's a reason to have the proliferation of you know C level titles? that really are C-level titles reporting into to a CEO is where, where do you land on that? Well, I'm, I'm not advocating for watering down the C-suite, but by any means, um, mm -hmm. but I do, I see security as a business critical discipline. Mm -hmm. And so the CEO isn't, does not have to be the expert on all the business disciplines, but the CEO is responsible for all the business disciplines. And so not having the CISO reporting directly to the CEO, that's kind of imagine let's let's reframe the scenario. Let's say that the uh, the chief marketing officer didn't report to the CEO. Mm -hmm. And the CEO now was getting insights about what we're doing to promote the brand and our, our service offerings through someone else, through like the CTO or mm -hmm. the CIO. That information would probably be translated slightly differently to the CEO. The CEO might not be able to make quite the same decisions in the same way. And no one would ever consider that to be acceptable. Like if you said today, no, the CMO reports to the CIO, that's information, right? <laughs> Isn't it? So the information goes to the CIO. No way. No one would ever find that to be acceptable. And security is, is the same idea. Yeah, I know. I think I, I, I play devil's advocate sometimes, but I think you're right. I think it's, it's something where especially when I think about my own you know, opportunities to lead businesses or areas of a business. And, and I think about what are the inputs I need as a leader to do my job effectively? So how do I you know, maximize my own success and, and the inputs that I need? To me, having that um, you know, person who represents the alternative to what I hear a lot of from other areas, I think becomes a, a very important thing. And it's not even, it's a, a, it's not even an alternative. It's just simply a, you know, to use your term, like to, to reframe the way it's being presented and looking at it from a different perspective and a, and a perspective that needs to stand alone, or at least needs to be thought of independently because it's such a unique perspective compared to, oh, let's go develop stuff. Let's add these projects to the queue. Let's add these resources, add, 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 versus saying, hey, do we recognize the unintended but very real risk we incur by doing these things at all? And 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 that risk management you know, function, whether manifesting in, a, in an application security context, you know, IT security context, you know, a, a um, financial, um, you know, category, like all of these things are, are such important counterweights to anything else we would just decide. I mean, this is why we end up with, um, you know, huge you know, debt from government, not to make this political, but like it's, it's an unchecked spend versus the alternative versus looking at true opportunity cost and, and all that. So I think it's a fascinating area to think about. I don't, I won't propose that we have any answers for anybody listening do this, this, and this, though I think hearing, you know, this person should report to the CEO is probably a good place to start, you know, thinking about it. Um, 
I, you know, I, I think that it, it helps people consider from a different perspective. Maybe we're missing something. Maybe our blinders haven't fully uh, appreciated even now the the you know challenges that um, you know attackers might pose to the success of our organization. And and that you know kind of going back to the the pandemic and, and all of that, the circumstances and the way we're working has has changed a bit. But it hasn't changed that much. I mean, we've had remote workers before. We have virtualized everything for a long time. And I think that a lot of the in-office work has been out of convenience or out of, um, you know, inertia or, you know, just that's just how we do it versus being a fundamentally different way for our businesses to function, you know, at least from a from an information worker perspective, especially. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly the buzz right now, everyone's like, oh, the, you know, workplace, the future of work is different. And yeah, things will be different. But I mean, really, the here's the main difference is that, oh, companies have realized they can trust their employees to work not at the office. Like, that's the, that's really the difference. <laughs> I mean, I've, I have so many friends that have been saying to me, they're like, isn't this great? Like, we can trust our employees to work from home. Like, <laughs> what we've been doing that for, are you kidding me of course like you should allow your people to work remotely work from home this is crazy yeah so that's a good thing that's a positive but that's not necessarily a security uh talking point that's just life <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely so i have a couple more questions while we still have a few minutes um the you've been doing this for a while and you've 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 run your business you you've seen a lot of stuff you've you've had a lot of interesting things but I, I want to know, is there anything that still surprises you in this space? Like, have you seen it all yet? Like, can you see around all the corners at this point? Or are there things that you've encountered that are just like, raise an eyebrow? Huh, I didn't I didn't think about that. The, the things that raise a lot of eyebrows are, are the humans that <laughs> have just really dumb opinions about things sometimes. Um, <laughs> so I don't think this is the question that you're asking, but I have to tell you this story. Okay because this raised an eyebrow for sure. So we, we, we did this research, we looked at uh, routers and we found all these vulnerabilities. And as security researchers, one of the things you go through is this, uh, it's called responsible disclosure. And the process is basically, once you find the vulnerabilities, you contact the afflicted manufacturer, uh, you work with them to say, here's the issues, you know, fix them. I'm gonna go publish this in whatever you define the period of time, usually it's like 30, 45 or sometimes 60 days. And the purpose is, of course, that the entire drive of security research is to make things better. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go give the bad guys, right, the the attack script. But at the same time, as security researchers, we want to be able to, to talk about the research and share and help drive the community forward. And mm -hmm. so you, you need to have sort of like a shot clock on it. Yeah. So that's what responsible disclosure essentially does. So we find all these vulnerabilities. We contact, there were, I forget exactly the number, but it was maybe seven or eight manufacturers. We contact all of them. And there was one in particular who didn't respond to, to anything. Mm -hmm. um, we tried and tried and tried and tried to follow up. And then eventually it was, all right, well, these guys, they're just not going to respond. We've attempted responsible disclosure. So we move forward with publishing the research. Uh, when that happens and, and you know that the issues haven't been fixed, you have to sort of hold back part of the actual disclosure because again you don't want to just give the attack blueprint right. so we published this research and the the news goes out and there was we we saw a lot of success with the press coverage on it and wouldn't you know it our phone rings on the phone is that company that we had called over and over and over again trying to work with them to help them fix the problem so uh -huh. they could have a positive story that says you know Hey, we at this company, we we were happy to hear about this blah 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 blah. You know, positive spin. Yep. So they call us and they said that they wanted to change things, and we're like, "Well, that's great. That's the whole point of security research is drive things forward." Yep. And they said we have an executive in your area. He's gonna come by tomorrow. We're like, "This is we're moving. This is like great." <laughs> Guy comes by tomorrow. Comes by the next day. I don't even think it was like 10 minutes until we figured out why he was really there. He did want to change things, but what he wanted to change was simply the story. He simply wanted us to change the report. And somehow he thought that just showing up and saying, now I'm not going to actually fix the product, but I would like you to change the report. He thought they actually thought <laughs> that was going to somehow us be like, Oh, we hadn't thought of that. Oh, that's, yes. let's, that's, let's that's an that. easy way. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. And the the part, this is where the, so that already was like, this is ridiculous, but where the eyebrow raised, he pulls out this piece of paper. It literally has a rubber stamp on it that says, uh, what did it say? It says certified. <laughs> and this, it was a memo from them. It says, we self-certify. There are no vulnerabilities in this product with a rubber stamp. It just said certified. <laughs> and we're looking at this thing like, where's the hidden camera? We're, we're obviously yes. getting punked right now, right? Yes. But unfortunately, I mean, that's it, it is stuff like that that makes us raise our eyebrows where the way that people think about this. And, and of course, I'm I feel bad that I'm making fun of a company who's not doing security right. I'm more making fun of the fact that they're after not doing it right. They're trying to diminish it and dis dismiss it that I, I reject that. Yes. I, I will call people out for that. <laughs> um, but it's. There are a lot of companies who who sort of still think about security that way. Like, can we sweep it on the rug? Can we make it non-existent? And um, there are cases where I I can empathize with that. You know, maybe it's that person who is in charge of security, and they're like, "Look, my CEO doesn't get it, and my butt's on the line here. Can you help?" Like, mm -hmm. I understand that that pressure. Yeah. But the uh, just trying to ignore it is of, of course never the way to go. So that <laughs> there's a story of my eyebrows raising for sure. <laughs> That's that's amazing. Um, so we only have like a, a couple more minutes, and and I want to get your perspective. I mean, you've been at, at this this book for a while, and and I've I've you know we've touched base from time to time during that process. How's it been? Like what what do you know now that you wish you knew earlier on, or has this been you know what has this experience been like? It's been transformational for for me as a human. I think. In what I mean by that, well, there's many things that I mean by that, but w one of the primary things is I'm better. I mean, that's it's as simple as that. I'm a better communicator. I understand the ideas better. I know how to uh, say them better. I know how to write more simply and clearly. And it's it's amazing to me how difficult it is to write. Like, it's hard to write simple. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I have had this amazing opportunity to befriend other authors and others in the security community and others in the technology community in uh, on their respective missions to change you know the world around them and and it just it just it feels good that I've been able to contribute something to advance the state of our industry and advance the state of not just security but of uh, software overall. And yeah, I, I just think I'm, I'm better at what I do than I was before I started this 18 months ago. That's awesome. I mean, I, I'm so excited for you and, and this, uh, this book and, and everything that you're doing and, and you deserve it. I mean, you've, you've done some really amazing things, but it's more than, you know, it's not what you've achieved. It's, it's how you're able to reach and help people that wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. And I think that, uh, you know, the work that you're doing and, and, you know, from the speaking to the, the business, to the book, um, you know, you're making a difference for people that, that won't have an opportunity otherwise. So hopefully, there's some people that are listening to the show today that that you know get to meet you either virtually through your book or at, at an event or what have you but um you know thank you from the broader community of folks that aren't necessarily deep in your space for reaching out and finding us to be able to teach us about some things we didn't necessarily even know we needed to know and and so thank you for that um so with that we're out of time so um Ted, you know, thank you so much for being on the show today. I can't wait to see what happens next for you and, and where the book goes. Um, but it's uh, it's awesome to see you doing it. And it's it's a hell of a job. I'm, I'm so excited to, to be able to finish reading it but and, and being able to share it with others. Um, you know, I, I, you've done something special. So so great job. And, and thanks. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. And if, if anyone wants to understand the ideas more or get a hold of me or figure out how to follow me on LinkedIn, if you just go to hackablebook.com, that's the best way to learn more or, or pick up the book or get a hold of me. Fantastic. And we will definitely make sure that those um, uh, websites and, and ways to reach Ted and his business are, you know, are available in the show notes. So check those out. Thank you for watching or listening today. Uh, you'll find links and more information about today's topic in the show notes. Subscribe to our show on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Visit Algman.com to learn more about Algman Data Leadership and the many ways we can help you become a data leader. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact.